just for a few minutes if it's okay. Good morning from The Hague, and good morning here in The Hague, the museum. My name is Thomas Fertus. I am the training editor of the Foundation Journalists for Justice, a foundation that tries to promote the understanding of international justice, and I'm the president of the Association of Journalists at the International Criminal Court. As the old saying goes in the Anglo-Saxon world, justice must not only be done, but also seem to be done. And therefore, we need journalists. Journalists will not go to all trials, but in domestic systems, they will go to high-profile trials, high-profile murder trials, um, big bank robbery trials or kidnapping trials. Um, and at the international courts, you will often see that there are no shoplifters or pickpockets. Most suspects at international courts will be high profile suspects. The proceedings will be interesting. It will be about former presidents, about generals, warlords, etc. And there will be coverage of high profile trials as a national system. But there is an important difference. It all started when the United Nations Security Council set up the um, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. There, the first important difference was that um, the trials were not conducted in the country itself where the crimes had been committed. It was, the trials were conducted in another country. If you look at the ICC, the trials are even conducted in another continent because all trials at the ICC until now were about Africa. That creates uh, two difficulties for the journalists writing about those trials. That's the theme of today's event. The journalists from the former Yugoslavia had the difficulty that they had to find the money to come to The Hague because The Hague is an expensive place to live. And wars uh, tend to destroy countries. War-torn countries are often poor. So the journalists had no money to come here. It was difficult for them to find money to come where. Secondly, the Dutch are very reluctant to give visas to people from poor countries. We saw that with the former Yugoslavia, and we see that with the African countries the current ICC trials uh, deal with. So the journalists um, found it difficult to get visas and residence permits, and that is what the AJICC, the Association of Journalists at the ICC, has been able to, to settle with the help of other countries like Germany and France that put pressure on the Netherlands. A third uh, difficulty journalists covering international criminal trials is that there are powerful people in their countries who do not want certain facts that are mentioned in those trials to be reported about. We saw it at the beginning uh, when President Franjo Tuchman of Croatia didn't want Croatian journalists about the evidence that emerged during trials here that he had something to do with war crimes that had been committed in neighboring Bosnia. So the Croatian Secret Service intimidated and monitored Croatian journalists working here. And that is a difficulty we also see at the ICC and we will hear more about today. Um, so these three aspects by way of introduction. Um, I will not give lengthy introductions of all four state speakers we have from four ICC situation countries. The idea is that they present themselves, their country, their situation, their experience. And I'll give the floor for first to uh, Benson from Uganda. <laughs> Thank you. A very good morning to all of you. My name is Benson Ongom, and I'm an investigative journalist from Uganda. Um, I come from a region that has been affected by the war for over two decades. And uh, one of the perpetrators of the crime was tried in the Hague. And you can imagine, uh, for the victims of the war, uh, finding justice 8,000 miles away from Africa. That is in the Hague. And some of the things we've been able to experience back home there is, as a journalist, the expectations that the people put onto you to tell the stories and also to feel that justice is being done. And these are some of the things we've been able to face back home because 
I remember traveling to The Hague for the opening statement of Dominic Nguyen, even the closing statement. And when you get back, because people have so many expectations of what is happening at The Hague. People have expectations, especially the victims. What is going on at The Hague? How does Dominic Nguyen look like? What is he saying in the court? And again, when you go back home there, you need to tell the stories. But we have uh, the challenges that journalists that we go through as well. Um, we often don't come to the Netherlands or the Hague to see what is happening. We really have to look at the websites of the ICC to read more about what is happening with Dominic Nguyen, what has, where has the case been able to reach, and you have to interpret to these people the victims of the war. I think the ICC has done quite well with the trust victims, trying to engage them, but again, you know, uh, this is a region that has had this war and the expectation from them is huge. So if anybody asks me that, does a common person back there feel that uh, he has got justice, even within the trial of Dominic Nguyen? Others have different perception. Others said yes or no, because others first of all believe. Uh, I remember when Dominic Nguyen uh, verdict was given, others believed Dominic wouldn't have been sentenced uh, because of his history. He was uh, abducted at a young age, and then he was um, turned into uh, the person he became. And others spoke about it and said, look, if it was us who has been taken to the heck, what would have been for us? But also others feel like you need justice. The sentence given to Dominic, is it good enough or not good enough? You have people that uh, their limbs have been cut off, uh, their nose, a different kind of victims. So the expectation is really huge uh, as an African journalist. And, um, and many times they look to have to tell these stories. So it's an experience that you really have to, to figure because I'm in the mainstream. I go and ready to speak on people. And again, these people look up to you, so you have to find a way uh, to interpret whatever happens here. But it, it has not been easy for my case. Um, I've been privileged enough to be here a couple of times to witness the trial. But again, I can tell you from the perspective where I come from, uh, people have different perspective and feelings uh, towards justice in the head. of the court must be triggered yeah. and your president, President Museveni, was the first president of a state party that triggered the yeah. jurisdiction of the court and your country is also historic because it, the first arrest warrants the ICC ever issued were about your country. Um, Ongwen was one of the suspects but the main leader is Joseph Kong and um, he still hasn't been apprehended. Uh, we see when we look at international justice uh, maybe a bit, bit more from a Dutch perspective because we are in the Netherlands, yeah. but it can take a long time to apprehend people like Adovan Karadzic or Adat Komladic. Yeah. Uh, how uh, optimistic are you that Kony will one day be arrested and taken to The Hague? I think as a Ugandan, we have to remain hopeful. I come from that region where the war was, so I'm also hopeful that one day um, justice will be found. I carried a small book with me in front of in my desk there. It's called The Captive. It has been written by a good friend of mine who was also a victim of the war, because many of us used to commute in the street. You have to go in the evening, late in the evening at 4 p.m. to go and find safety and then come back in the morning. So again, speaking from Northern Uganda, from perspective of Uganda, you, we, we are really hopeful that government and the ICC one day will get Joseph Coyne because he needs to account for what he has done. We think Dominic Gongwen is a small fish, the big fish is Joseph Cohen, and we're looking forward to that. We've been uh, hearing a lot of news uh, about his health, especially from the people that are returning. We only hope that one day he can surrender or he can be arrested, and some of these victims of the war will able to get justice. Because I think for many of us to see Joseph Cohen being tried, um, and some of the things that he has been able to do, he can be accountable for, is what we look forward. But again, we are hopeful. I think we have not lost hope uh, that Joseph Coin one day will, will be able to face justice. What do you say about the argument of those who say um, Dominic Ongwen is not a criminal but a victim because he was kidnapped as a child and then later 
when he raped and killed and mutilated, he just followed the role models he had seen during his adolescence. I think the argument goes two ways. If you come from an environment and a background where I come from, you need to understand. And, and for me, I sympathize with Dominic Nguyen, arrested at a tender age, the different variation of his age when he was arrested. Some say he was 12, he was going to school, he was a teenager, and he was arrested, time to become who he is. We know Dominic Nguyen in this room as a killer. We know him as somebody who has tortured and raped. But if you look back, and I'm happy for the audience, one of my friends who I grew up is there is Robert. Robert, we grew up together and we commute together. So it would have been me who was arrested at that age. It would have been Robert. It would have been anybody. And taken to the bush. And you know, Joseph Cohen had this spirituality thing that turns people. It has been an argument in the court. Um, people, I think the defense team for Dominic Nguyen says, uh, Coin had a spiritual thing that turns people to become what they have become. So I think I sympathize with him because he didn't intend, it's not like those people who walked in the bush and joined the LRA. He was arrested, I mean abducted at a tender age. He was turned to become, he grew up at his very, I think the time that he needed to start understanding and doing the right thing at the age of 17, 18. Most times that is the age when somebody gets mature and starts really making decisions with a bit of concern. So for Dominic Gongwen at that age, being arrested, you got to sympathize with him. But also that does not say that he should not hold accountable for whatever he did. I think also 12 years is quite the age that somebody can make a decision. There are many commanders of the LRA who are abducted like him. They never became Dominic Gongwen. They never tortured people. They never burned people in the IDP camps. So it's a mixed reaction feel sorry for him as somebody who grew up there who experienced the situation that he did, but at the same time, I think uh, he has to be held accountable. There is a Hollywood movie that has been made about the situation in northern Uganda and about what was done to the children there. Um, and it, when it came out, it was good publicity for the ICC, and I was often asked to come into Dutch schools and to talk to the Dutch kids about that movie. Do you think it reflects you, you as a Ugandan journalist and as a Ugandan citizen, do you think that that movie reflects the reality well? I think there are a couple of movies that have been uh, done, especially to relate to Northern Uganda, but I think uh, if you ask me, I'll critique some of it because some really don't uh, tell our story fully. Um, some do, some try to show what exactly happened in Uganda. I've been disappointed with some of the movies because I think if you're looking at the LRO in Northern Uganda, you need to look at two perspectives, the LRA and the government forces. So I find like the, the movies really pushes so much on the rebel side, but nobody's talking about the responsibility and the role of the government forces during the, the war. And it's a big concern. Even uh, when Dominic Nguyen was being tried, I think uh, the defense team put an argument about the role of the government forces, which is Uganda People Defense Forces. And it's a feeling that we have there because the victims of the war that feel like even in those uh, case area, the UPDA, which is government forces, did even much worse than the rebels. So I think the movies have been good because I think many people in Europe and other parts of the country have been able to see and share our story, but I think we need to do more. We need to go and really understand the story. Uh, I always say a journalist who comes from a certain place should be able to understand the context of the place, the economy, the politics that makes you tell the story better. Okay, thank you very much, Benson. I appreciate it. And then now. A question by you. And then next, I shall ask uh, Carla from uh, Venezuela to take the floor and introduce herself and her country. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure, a real honor to be here. What is happening in Venezuela is a catastrophe in progress. And I was born there when Venezuela was one of the richest countries in the world. But lately, um, Venezuela turned into a little Yemen with more than nine million people suffering from starvation. It's like a big Syria with more than 7.2 million refugees. It is uh, dangerous, more dangerous than Mexico, with more than 400,000 killings since 1999, and 24 years under a dictatorship. I know that maybe for some of you, the political situation in Venezuela might be confusing. 
after the rigged election in 2018, um, 63 countries didn't recognize, stopped recognizing Maduro as the president of Venezuela, and an interim government emerged as a legitimate authority. But lately, we can see war leaders, or even opposition leaders in Venezuela, who used to call Maduro a dictator, shaking hands with him and referring to him as President Maduro again. Some decide to ignore that in 2017, Maduro became the first leader in power in the Western Hemisphere to be investigated for crimes against humanity. As I speak, there could be someone standing in front of a judge, uh, covered in blood, without nails, fractured ribs, even without an eye, because uh, as a result of a hit with a rifle, as it happened to Alberto Salazar Caban, or someone merely dying due to tortures, such as Captain Acosta Arevalo, he went into a courtroom in a wheelchair and died hours after. Prosecutor Karim Khan has told us in each one of his reports that the evidence he has goes beyond reasonable doubt. He has enough evidence to prove that in Venezuela there is a lethal systematic pattern to first dehumanize, then break and even disappear opponents or people perceived as opponents by the regime. They, in the OAS, according to the OAS uh, panel experts report, Diosdado Cabello, congressman and principal figure of the regime, has been allegedly given direct orders to commit crimes against humanity to the director of the Sevin, which is one of the cruelest repressive forces right now in Venezuela. And they also point out Calixto Ortega, the current head of the diplomatic mission of Venezuela here in the Netherlands. After concluding that he has been allegedly legitimizing enforced disappearances, torture, and other crimes in his current role as a judge of the Supreme Court of the regime, he has more access to the ICC than his own victims. It's like having here the executioners sitting in The Hague while the victims are still in death cells or sentenced to flee into exile. Maduro's name has been mentioned 73 times in the third report of the UN fact-finding mission. And they, they assure that he, as the leader of the Venezuelan regime, has been given allegedly direct orders to commit illegal detentions, tortures, and other crimes. These aren't an isolated or an individual decisions made by mentally disturbed officials. They learn that everyone obeys to a perverse plan conceived by Maduro himself. The highest level officials in the regime are the ones who decide who will be in prison facing these atrocities. There could be, it can be any politician, journalist, human rights defenders, or even someone who is expressing criticism or complaints against the regime through a simple WhatsApp group. They create laws and a chain of command that guarantees impunity. The executioners never face justice. Instead, they are promoted and awarded after carrying out barbaric beatings, electrical shock in private parts, uh, asphyxiation with plastic bags, uh, rapes, or even hangings against innocent people. Oh, the thing is that Venezuelans, in Venezuela there are no citizens. They are enemies once they decide to use the right to express themselves freely. They stop being people, they become military targets as the first step in every extermination process in history. They are not a human being anymore. They can be discarded and outraged without there being an ethical conflict. It's like disappearing something worthless. The regime objectifies you. They discovered in the UN fact-finding mission report that in the DGSIM and in DECEBIN, the headquarters of torture in Venezuela, they put officials in guard for three to four days so they can use to seeing people being tortured. And the ones who enjoy to practice these barbaric acts are chosen. Every dissent has the same consequences. You will be a traitor, a terrorist, the mind behind a plot to overthrow Maduro, 
And it doesn't matter if you are a military who is trying to defend the constitution against the regime, or if you are just texting uh, in a WhatsApp group about the lack of medicine, top water, worthy wage. You will end up in the same torture chambers con condemned or sentenced to about 30 years in prison without any sort of evidence. It not, doesn't matter if you are the father, the taxi driver, the neighbor of the person whom they consider an enemy. If they can find who they are looking for, they will make someone pay just for being a relative, just for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. In fact, in the UN fact-finding mission, they, they learned that Maduro's regime is applying the sip and have pattern just as the Nazis justify punishment against relatives. In fact, one, one example, Maria Auxiliadora Delgado Tabosky's brother was accused of trying to kill Maduro, but since he was in the US, the regime chose to make her and her husband pay, and they were sentenced to 30 years in prison. It's pretty difficult to victims to speak up. Every NGO is persecuted by the regime. Half of the country has no access to internet, and free media is basically on digital platforms, but 80% of the population is poor, and their priority is to eat, not to have a smartphone. In other words, you can go to the judges, nor the police, nor the media. The other channel challenge for us as a journalist is to keep our country active and hopeful um, in that the, the, out the outcome of this investigation will reveal the truth and will bring justice and reparation to the victims. Uh, terrible crimes, you have also you have also mentioned that um, independent external experts yeah. of the Organization of American States mm -hmm. and of the United Nations Organization have investigated and documented those crimes. Um, have Venezuelan journalists who can, who can because they live in exile, yes. uh, approached the office of the prosecutor of the ICC and asked uh, Karim, the chief prosecutor, when are you coming with your first arrest warrants? Well, I, I, we hope that this will come soon because we just uh, filled like 9,000 forms. Uh, this is the number of victims the, who speak up. Even though the, the threats, the risks, it was a huge number. It, uh, we are so proud of the victims because they're in Venezuela, they have surrounded by the regime. They are not in a safe heaven. They are always like asking you, please uh, tell my story, but at the same time they can call you and tell you, please don't publish because I will be killed. And I received, for example, a, a call from a victim from jail and he told me he was begging me to interview him. And I, and I had to say to him, I need to call to your lawyer because I don't know if this is safe for you. And, I, and in fact, I called his lawyer and his lawyer told me, please don't do it, he will be killed. And, and you have to, to manage how the Venezuelans are um, cynical or even skeptical about what the results of this investigation might be because they know that uh, a delayed justice is a denied yes. justice and yes. they are frustrated because time is not on their side. But at the same time, the regime is terrified, yes. thinking what will be the, the, the outcome of this investigation yes. because there, there is no statute of limitation for yes. these crimes. Investigations are confidential and uh, witnesses must be protected yes. until there comes a point when the first arrest warrants become public. Uh, but my question was, uh, have Venezuelan journalists asked the question as to when you might expect something. The thing is that when, when it's about the criminal investigation, they don't, they can, they never give you a time. Mm -hmm. They, they are not uh, able. I, I'm not sure if they are not able. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that they don't want you to, to have more expectations than you, you, that you need to, to, to have in this moment because we all know that this process is long. Uh, it's not fair for victims but because victims, uh, of course, the victims want uh, the persecutors or the, the, um, the executioners to be behind bars. But most of it, they want the truth. And you can have the truth before the, the reparation. 
you, you don't need to get uh, a warrant arrest to have the truth because they, they, the, the first thing that they need is to know what happened inside those torture chambers, how my son died, how my husband died. Because they, they told you all the time, I'm already dead. This is why they are, they're taking risks, because they, they lost their most beautiful thing in life, a son, a beloved one, and they died when their beloved ones died. And they just are expecting to know what happened to them and the, them to be the, the last ones to be tortured or in jail or killed in Venezuela. The families want to have certainty about what happened to their yes. loved ones. Uh, yes. That's why it's so Justice. important that they know what has happened. That's why we have the International Commission of Missing Persons here in The Hague uh, that was set up to identify genocide victims in Bosnia and to give certainty uh, to the families so yes. that they can could organize a dignified burial. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you. And Thank then you, Thomas. <laughs> and then I shall now invite Lean from the Philippines to take the floor. Thank you, Thomas. Good morning, everyone. I am Lian from the Philippines. I have been a journalist for 13 years. As a journalist, I have many difficult conversations, but the most difficult has not been with angry government officials or even angry editors. It was with victims who sometimes I've had to explain to why sometimes justice does not feel just. For example, in 2019, after 10 years, there was finally a judgment on the massacre of 58 people by a political dynasty and their private army in the southern island of Mindanao. This was the single deadliest attack on the Philippine press and put us one of the world's most dangerous country for journalists. And it finally had a judgment. It was a good moment until one of the widows called me. I was in front of the Supreme Court. She said, how soon do you think can I claim my damages because I need it for the hospital bills of my daughter? The daughter was 10 years old. She's as old as her father's murder case. I'll never forget having to stare at the grand facade of our Supreme Court and having to tell her, don't count on the damages just yet, not soon. It will go through appeals. And she said, how, long, how much longer do I have to wait? And it was the most difficult, I don't know, that I have ever said in my life. Several years before that, I was at a court in the city capital. A community was petitioning the lower court to get rid of police powers, to knock on their doors and search for drugs and drug suspects. The year was 2017, and the death toll of Rodrigo Duterte's war on drugs has reached 7,000. The community has been terrorized by knocks, by the possibility of being put in a drug list, or by dead bodies. The court order that day was something that lawyers and reporters would call as very procedural. They had failed to get an injunction. But then failed to get an, failed is a strong word for communities. So I watched as their lawyer try her hardest to convert legalese into simple language um, and assure the anxious people, mostly women, that the case, the merits of the case go on. Um, and the merits of the case go on. In fact, it is still going on because to this day, there is no answer whether it's constitutional for police to knock on doors and randomly search for drugs. The grander um, ambition, the more ambitious petition to declare the entire campaign against drugs unconstitu unconstitutional is still pending with our Supreme Court after six years. It is important for the communities to ask these questions, but it is also difficult to explain to them why they are not answered until now. For example, one day during lockdown, I was talking with a woman, a mother, who had lost her son, 17 years old at the time, killed by Duterte's policemen. The Philippine Ombudsman has just dropped her case because all the witnesses have withdrawn. And this is a common thing. I have had to navigate cases of witnesses, drug suspects, their families going into hiding out of fear. I have had to drop stories because of safety. So I asked her, are you sure you want to speak to me on record? And she said, yes. I asked her, aren't you scared? And she said, I did not kill my son. They killed my son. Why should I be scared? They should be scared. That took guts. But to be honest, they don't have to be that gutsy. One trauma is enough. That reporters have had to extract these stories out of them repeatedly for the last six years is another layer of trauma I unfortunately and admittedly have participated in. Since then, the death toll has ballooned to 27,000, and then we just stopped counting. Out of that number, policemen has admitted to killing 7,000 in what they call as legitimate police operations against drugs. They call it, presum they invoke presumption of regularity. 
Sometime again during the lockdown, um, there was a drug war story that got on the nerves of important people in high office. These were important sources. They're actually even good people. They were arguing for more belief in the domestic justice process. It is a good argument, but I'm not the one they have to convince. And for a journalist in a company that has been closed down by the Duterte government, it's sometimes tempting to just protect the access to them. Um, but my editors always say, never cede an inch of your freedom to report the truth and always hold the line. But more than the journalistic principle, I, was, I wanted to honor the story of victims. Because later that afternoon, I was talking to a widow whose um, husband was killed in the drug war also, but there's no suspect. And that is emblematic of the thousand other cases in the campaign against drugs. There are no suspects. And if there's no suspect, then there's no case, then possibly no justice ever. So she told me, Lian, I have lost faith in the domestic justice process. Here's a woman who, through grief, had to become a campaigner, an advocate. She organized widows, and they would go to police stations, and they would say, I'm, I just need the documents to claim benefits for the dead people from local council because they have to make up those scripts. Otherwise, they don't get the documents ever. Um, and as a journalist, I cannot be that creative. I can only be direct and honest about what I want um, for information. And many other times, it's difficult to get information. Sometimes a simple a question asks, how many cases are you investigating? I don't even get a direct answer. So when she says, I have lost trust in the domestic justice process here, I don't have to agree with her, but I understand where it's coming from. But then that leads me to a more difficult conversation, because what's next after the domestic justice process? They say the International Criminal Court, the International Criminal Court that has no police power. We can all remember when the ICC issued an arrest warrant against Vladimir Putin. It was a good moment, but a good moment for who? For top lawyers, for sure, for advocates, for academics, even for journalists um, like my colleagues here today who gasps in awe just by being here in The Hague. But how good is it a moment for victims who are not here, who are a thousand miles away living in poverty and in fear in Manila or in Venezuela or in Uganda or in Burundi? So when they say that they've lost, uh, it always leads me to a difficult conversation how to manage that expectation from an international criminal court. And when I talk about the ICC, my stories always have to compete with the criticism that ICC is a colonial court. Um, my ICC stories drown in the nagging of Duterte supporters who say, why should, they, why should they believe the ICC when the United States isn't even a part of the ICC? And that's a good question. But six years of coverage and 10 months of taking a law master's degree I still don't have a good answer to that question. So again, I go back. The good moment for us over a Putin arrest warrant, reveling in the foreign policy implication of it all, can be lost in the everyday struggles of these victims who had lost their providers and their ability to work because of these crimes. Hope is a strong agent, we all know that. But we have to learn to be more careful that they are not utterly false hopes. There are many fake news about the ICC in my country. Most of the fake news come from Duterte himself and from his top legal aides. That's according to Vera Files Fact Check. Most of the, many of the fake news are about jurisdiction, which, is, which can easily obfuscate discussion because they're hard to understand. But when Rodrigo Duterte says, I will never subject myself to the judgment of foreigners, it sticks. It sticks because we are a country anxious of invaders having been colonized for, for 450 years. And remember, we have a Hague arbitral victory against China in 2016, and yet to this day, it is not truly felt by our fishermen out there in open sea. But this is what I will say about international justice. We never put our dictator, Ferdinand Marcos Sr., on trial at home. Most of the relevant judgments came from abroad. It is an imperfect narrative so imperfect that it is proving to be helpless against historical revisionism. But it is still one of the last frontiers to preserving the truth about what happened during martial law 36 years ago, one of the darkest era of our country. So for all of its limitations and all of its flaws, we have the chance to make international justice preserve the truth about what went on in those six bloody years of Duterte's war on drugs. Victims of the drug war are very proactive. They have the agency. They are transcribing their own experience 
and documenting their own experience and transcribing their own paperwork to send to the ICC registry. At the very least, we have to make an effort to make them feel that it, that it is not for nothing. Because we can lose cases, we know that. We can lose patients just by trying. That is a fact of the law that we cannot change. But we have a chance to make international justice ensure that Filipinos never forget. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned the problem of uh, jurisdiction. Thank you. Your president even tried to um, leave the Rome Statute system. Has successfully left the Rome Statute. Yes, but that does not mean, that's important to understand the functioning of the ICC, that does not mean that the ICC cannot investigate and prosecute the crimes that were committed while the Philippines were a state party, because otherwise that would be too easy to yes. just escape justice. Yes. And what's also interesting to mention is that um, you worked for Repla, mm -hmm. and Repla, for its work, uh, got the Nobel Peace Prize. Maybe you are too modest to say that, so that's it's, why it's I, my I am boss saying it. Who got the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> yes, Repla got the Nobel Peace Prize for its good journalistic work in very, very difficult circumstances. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Lee. Thank you, Thomas. And then I'm now inviting Pierre Clavier from Burundi to take to take the floor. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pierre Clavier Nyonghuru. Uh, I am a Burundian journalist. Uh, I'm working for uh, Voice of America uh, in the Central African uh, uh, region. So. Uh, mine is uh, to talk about the, uh, the challenges and the risk of those journalists who are working on uh, international justice matters. So, uh, I am a refugee journalist since 2015. Uh, in 2015, Burundi, uh, there was a, a, cri a political crisis. So, so uh, we as journalists, we managed, we reported uh, those uh, uh, for more do, those uh, uh, crimes against uh, humanity, uh, like uh, murder, like uh, mass assassination, torture, enforced disappearance, and the rape, and uh, others. So in 2016, ICC began, uh, began the investigation in Burundi. So we as journalists, we were reporting uh, those crimes, but we became the enemy, the most enemies of the government. So government and uh, ruling party uh, militia, militia uh, called the Bonera Kure, they turned the guns on uh, journalists who were reporting uh, on those uh, uh, crimes. So uh, as now, uh, more than 100 journalists we are uh, in exile. Uh, and uh, from uh, exile in 2016, I continued to do my investigative uh, journalists. And uh, I went in many uh, uh, refugee camp in Rwanda, in Tanzania, in uh, Uganda, in, uh, in Kenya, and I met many, uh, many, many victims on, of those uh, uh, crimes. So uh, they, 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 they didn't uh, know how to do, but uh, through my reports, they get uh, connected to, uh, with uh, lawyers, with uh, human rights activists, and for the now, more than uh, 2,000 uh, two, um, uh, communication or cases are brought before the, the, the ICC. So last year, uh, in November, uh, December, uh, I came in, uh, in The Hague uh, to continue my investigative uh, uh, work. So I, I did a report, uh, a report which uh, was like a bomb in Burundi. I, I published a, a news uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, international arrest warrants were coming soon, so where the, 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 it, is, it, is all, it is it was like a bomb in Burundi. They they said that uh, I am the most enemy of the government. I I want to to to, to see the, the head of state to, to be cut. I want to overthrow the the power in Burundi. Uh, how can I do this with my mic, my pen, my camera? I can't. So. They uh, sent me a, a clear message saying that uh, they want to kill me, they want to, to get me uh, on me even my, uh, in my exile in, in, in Rwanda. Uh, so it, uh, it was a, a big uh, problem for me. But mine is not to, uh, to discourage fellow journalists. Yeah, rather it is to, 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 to give them courage. Uh, because they can't, uh, they can't, uh, they can't stop. They think they can't stop us doing uh, 
uh, our investigative uh, uh, report because for now it is time of uh, social media and uh, uh, even you can hold uh, uh, media outlet from uh, from your home. So uh, we, we we want to be uh, uh, the, the, the vegetable uh, voice of voiceless people because journalists are not uh, enemies. Journalism is not uh, a crime. We, we want to see uh, uh, victims uh, having their uh, justice. So uh, mind is to, 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 to give you courage and uh, also to ask for uh, international community, for ICC, uh, to, 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 to think how to protect those people, those journalists who are risking uh, their lives in the cause of uh, international uh, journalists uh, uh, and they can't, they can't uh, stop us doing uh, this job. Thank you. Pierre Claudia, you mentioned that you reported about uh, upcoming arrest warrants for the Voice of America and yes. for Burundi media in exile. Yes. And you could report about those arrest warrants because you have been talking to the Office of the Prosecutor. So you must have asked the right questions, because normally, as we heard before, uh, OTP investigators are a bit reluctant to talk to journalists and uh, to say uh, how far they are with their investigations. So uh, you must be good journalists to ask the right questions. <laughs> so I, uh, I will not discover the, uh, the secret that I have in mind uh, between me and, uh, and the ICC, uh, because uh, it, is, it is a closure now. But I think, I hope, in the coming days, coming month, coming year, uh, we will have uh, uh, those uh, international uh, warrant arrests uh, sending in Burundi. But we want to uh, when that uh, uh, those people who are working on uh, international justice matters to be protected. Because uh, if those uh, international uh, warrant arrests are sent, uh, those people will get uh, a serious problem. But uh, uh, many victims in uh, refugee camps in Rwanda, in Uganda, in Kenya, in Tanzania, they are uh, uh, awaiting uh, for those uh, international uh, arrest warrants. And you reported about those warrants, and then you received yes, threatening emails? Yes, I, I, I reported uh, about those, uh, those international warrants uh, uh, arrest, but I didn't, I didn't not much mention the, the names, but I, I know with, uh, some of them. And uh, you received those threatening emails in yes. French and in Kirundi? In Kirundi, well, be, because in, in Burundi we use uh, normally a uh, mixed language, language. Uh, Kirundi, Kinyarwanda, and the French, they use the, 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 those languages. They send me uh, an email, and, and uh, I, I, of course, say the some uh, international organization uh, who, uh, uh, which work uh, with journalists and, uh, of course, the, the government for uh, the Netherlands. Uh, so that I can be uh, uh, protected because uh, I, uh, I became the, the most uh, important uh, enemy for uh, my country, uh, which I'm not. The emails were analyzed by Free Press Unlimited, yes, and, uh, which is an organization based in Amsterdam that uh, tries to help the journalists in situation countries, as they are called in the ICC context. And they have a very good security experts who made a risk analysis and who found the emails to be very threatening, and uh, you were advised to ask for political asylum in the Netherlands. Unfortunately, the Dutch have a very stupid rule that says that you are not allowed to work uh, uh, when you ask for political asylum, which means that there are accomplices of the Burundian regime that tries to make your, your work impossible. They just have to threaten you, then you ask for asylum because you feel obliged, and then you can't work anymore. So they have reached uh, what they want. You don't continue with your reports. Whereas you could do useful work um, in French for the situation countries in Africa with ongoing trials here, uh, Central African Republic, Mali, etc. But you are not allowed to work. There is a party that wants to change that rule, B66. It was spoken about in Parliament. There is an initiative. On, it was discussed in Parliament on Monday. But the Prime Minister's party doesn't want asylum seekers to be able to work. Uh, and um, one might also mention um, arrest warrants might be about people from the former regime. The president has died by now. And he did the same thing as Duterte. He left the system, room setting system, but the court status restriction for crimes committed in the past. Yes. Now he is in jail. Okay, thank you very much for your clavier. So uh, 
um, could all our four guests now please join me on the podium. And it is the moment uh, to uh, also take questions from the public because there have been some hands lifted. Um, but so first one. Yes. But of course I first had to give an opportunity to all four guests to present themselves. But um, now it's time for the public. There had been some hands on the floor. Yes, Rosemary? Thank you. Um, my question goes to Carla. Uh, Carla spoke very well about the situation in Venezuela, but she did not speak about her experiences as a journalist, what she has gone through and uh, I'm aware that she has done a lot and she has been under threat. Can she just speak a little about her personal experience? The thing is that we as a journalist in the exile think first about the people are there surrounded by the regime in dead cells, in torture chambers. And your story, of course, everyone in Venezuela has been a victim, but we cannot compare our exile with the people is suffering there in, in, and be forgotten about the world, for the world. But anyway, <laughs> thank you for asking me. Um, my husband and my father-in-law were persecuted. This is why I am in the exile. And I have a warrant arrest <laughs> in my own country. They um, admitted last year, last year after nine years in the exile all the things, all the things that we are sharing in a free media um, happen to, to have an effect on them. And the truth is so powerful that they can avoid it. They can deal with that. Even though when in Venezuela we don't have free media, we don't have, um, we have just gossip from, from citizens in the streets because Nobody wants to be portrayed as an um, opposition, as a um, dissent. And this is why people uh, um, choose to, to be silent about the things happening there. And because we are in the exile, we are more secure. We, have, we are in a safe place. We can speak up for them. And the truth is um, dangerous for them because they don't want the world to, to be comfortable. Uh, they want to, they come, they will be comfortable uh, doing business with them, but we can do that. We are, we are fighting against it because uh, um, the world, I, I, I think that the world is exhausted. The world is tired about not having a solution for us, not being able to help in us to regain democracy and freedom. And maybe they are, their options are, okay, we have to deal with this guy in power because we don't know what else to do. We have been putting sanctions and we have been putting pressure against him and nothing doesn't work. It doesn't work. But we have to, to be a, a wall against that. And we have to still tell him the truth. Thank you. There had been a hand up there, the gentleman, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ferdi Beer. I'm a Dutch influencer. Uh, I paid myself, but I'm a volunteer for the Republic of Indonesia. Um, uh, I, uh, I went by the king and queen to Indonesia during uh, 2020. This economic mission, and I stayed there in the beginning of the COVID-19 as uh, one of the only uh, Dutch uh, volunteers there. And I joined also uh, when I came back uh, to the Netherlands with a G20 uh, group, uh, preparation, preparation with the Civil 20 uh, group. Uh, I have a mission to give Dutch smart solutions for a sustainable and happy social economics for all the local citizens in Indonesia that will be spread over the world. And my vision is to make Indonesia uh, the world's peace mediator of the world. So my question to you is, what is your mission and vision for your country? This is a, a difficult question, but maybe uh, for, for more peace, for more uh, 
a sustainable future or um, the, the goal where what, what you're writing about I want to know that for the future for your country in a positive and op optimistic way a difficult question but you can think about you can you can you don't have to answer it but think about it when you, when you are writing so your, your question is um, how to transform Indonesia to make for each of their countries, what is your personal vision for the future for your country? Or you can think about it and answer it later. Maybe you can answer later. Yes. There was another hand there. Yes, yes, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you um, for, for, for the amazing stories you've all shared. Um, mine, uh, my question goes to uh, ben Olam, I'm actually very excited to see you here. Um, after years growing up, uh, you know, trying to commute and running from the abductions in northern Uganda. The, 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 as you said, the case on Dominic Ongwen is, is a selected case in, in northern Uganda on just, you know, one rebel leader. Now, the case has gone on and it has finished. The question of reparation is something that, you know, is sort of creating a lot of division on how the ICC can approach it. Um, we know that, yes, Dominic Nguyen committed crimes in selected places, and people have been brought here uh, as witnesses and things like that. And I know that ICC, of course, will give reparations to those selected victims but we know the war was across northern Uganda, and we know the victims were at scale. Um, I don't know from your own perspective or what sort of approach the ICC should take in terms of, so that it's not selected victims, so that, it, yeah. Thank you very much. I think that is one of the questions that we're asking ourselves in, uh, in the part of According to ICC, is going to the case areas where Dominic Nguyen is alleged, and now some of the actually confirmed because he sentenced some of those uh, crimes in four areas. But we are talking about a region, uh, probably of one million people, and from our understanding, the reparation is going directly to the victims, and these victims are in these four case areas. So the question that we have, Thomas, and we have asked the ICC a couple of times, what of the other victims that were directly and indirectly involved? Because again, Robert is a victim, I'm a victim. I grew up in that part of the region, I had gunshots, Dominic Nguyen was a commander. So you're telling me uh, people that are going to be able to get reparations are the people from those case locations. It's something that the ICC needs to think about. But also, one of the things that we've been able to have as a discussion is what kind of reparation is good for us? for the case areas or for the community. Is it gonna be money? Is it gonna be, because nothing really is gonna pay us back. Nothing is gonna have that mother who has lost a, a son, a daughter, a husband back. So what kind of reparation? What is the thought of the ICC and the people who are trying to identify the reparation uh, uh, that is gonna be given? Is it gonna be in terms of social services? Are there going to be schools? Are they going to reconstruct those health centers? Because that is, our fixation now. So, again, that is a, a very good question, and uh, I really think that the ICC should think broadly about it. And um, how I wish, as somebody from the part of the region, as a journalist, the reparation should really cover the victims of the war, and the victim is entirely almost uh, northern Uganda. It should not be a selected case area. Maybe uh, we should also add, for the benefit of those people who are here to learn a bit more about the ICC system. Uh, the ICC has a so-called trust fund for victims, uh, and states can make voluntary contributions to that trust fund. Of course, at the ICC, there is a possibility uh, for the judges to say uh, a criminal has to pay reparations, like in domestic systems. But the problem is many uh, convicts uh, don't have money to pay reparations, like Dominic Ongwen has no money. Yeah. So that's why it's good that there is that trust fund filled by voluntary contributions made from states. And the trust fund has two mandates. It has a reparations mandate and an assistance mandate. 
the reparations mandate can work only once a suspect has been convicted. When the, convic when the con uh, judges have convicted the suspect, they can decide about the reparations and how to make them. But uh, in the beginning, when the RCC started to work, there came, there's money that came into the trust fund, but there were no convictions. And it would have been a bit awkward to leave the money in the trust fund, whereas there are, were victims who needed help. And one of the very first projects of the trust fund, if not the first, we would have to check, was an assistance mandate project in northern Uganda when uh, money was given by the trust fund to a group of uh, Dutch surgeons who volunteered to help all those poor people in northern Uganda who had been victims of uh, Joseph Koch, the resistance army, whose uh, lips and noses and ears had been cut. Those, those poor people were clearly victims of crimes, even if there was no convict yet. And that way the trust fund could help under its assistance mandate. Let me just uh, speak on in 30 seconds. I think um, when we're talking about reparation, I think it's, uh, as you've said, it's mandated that the people will get. But also one of the questions that we're dealing with in our country is what is the mandate of governor? Mm -hmm. Because again, it not, should not be left to the ICC. Government hold the responsibility to repair the people in that region, to reconstruct the environment that we have been able to lose over time. So the question has been, what is government doing? Also to make sure, because it was their responsibility. If you look at one of the, the case area where Dominic Ongano was being tried, people were killed in IDP camps. And IDP camps is mandated for government forces to protect the people in the IDP camps. So when we're talking about operation, um, it's a conversation we've been able to with what is the role of government of Uganda towards the people of northern Uganda. Yes, that's also something we can, we might add. Uh, um, Ongwen has been convicted for crimes committed in those camps where the uh, internally displaced people were. Mm -hmm. And formally in the court system, reparations can only be paid to the victims of uh, Ongwen's crimes that he has been convicted for, and that's the people in the camps. But there were other victims and they can be helped through the assistance mandates. Thanks all of you for being here. Um, there were two things I wanted to ask about and specific to the theme of this symposium, which is the challenges for reporting on this. And I thought also um, the hosting organization could participate in this as well. There were two themes that I heard um, um, Faking, uh, fake news um, targeting the ICC, and also um, this beautifully phrased, um, it, the ICC being a frontier for preserving the truth. Um, across the board, could you speak a little bit to um, what, your, what the ICC and what um, doing journalism within um, the, you know, this area enables you to do? Um, and maybe what the challenges are from moving from your countries uh, and reporting in them, as you've already mentioned, and being able to accomplish some things here. And just as an add-on, and, and, and came from you, Carla, is this uh, notion that the, uh, the, the perpetrators are, are amongst us here at the ICC. And when you discover this and learn this, how that informs the journalism that you're doing or propels it forward. The, the challenge, the big challenge for us as a journalist is, as I said, to keep our country active and hopeful on what the outcome of this investigation will bring, not just the truth, justice and reparation to the victims. Because as I said, Venezuelans tend to be skeptical and cynical because the Maduro's regime has made them believe that they can manipulate international justice as they do at home. And the truth is that the, the regime is terrified about what the results might be. But at the same time, Venezuelans are frustrated, thinking that time is not on their side. Um, as a friend said, let's begin with the end in mind. <laughs> you know, The results of this investigation will bring the truth. And I, I have an example. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, the pretrial chamber told us that 900 victims uh, filled their forms to ask the pretrial chamber to continue the investigation. But the regime changed the narrative and they tell 
okay, the pretrial chamber is saying in his in this, in this report that there are no victims. There are no formally victims. We cannot respond to those victims. Of course, we are not in a trial yet. This is why, formally speaking, we don't have victims. But the victims exist. The only thing is that pretrial chamber doesn't let the regime to re respond them because it's not the moment to do it. But they changed the narrative. They, cha they, they said to the audience, and, and they were all asking me, Carla, the, the, the process stopped there in the Hague? No, it's not like this. The, the thing is that we have no justice at home, and people think that in international home, they can do the same. And they have the power to stop things, to change things, and that's not the truth. And we have to keep fighting against them, and against this narrative every day, every single day. If I may add, the ICC has been the victim of fake news and framing as of the beginning. One famous example is um, African presidents like Bashir and Kenyatta were targeted by uh, ICC investigations saying uh, the ICC is a Euro European court for Africa, white people in The Hague uh, prosecuting African leaders. Um, that framing was supported by um, expensive public relation firms in London, paid by Kenyatta and the Ruto, respectively the incumbent and the former president of Kenya. Um, what the OTP could do, and that is what Luis Moreno Ocampo, the first uh, chief prosecutor, did, was to just make a list and show that it was the African countries themselves that had asked the OTP to come and investigate in that country. Or it was the Security Council of the United Nations, uh, uh, where Africa is also represented, that had made the referrals for first um, Sudan and then Libya. But that little sheet of paper, unfortunately, was not disseminated as well. That list and that list was not quoted. Those arguments were not quoted as well as um, the eternal uh, uh, European Court for Africa argument. So it also, can also be difficult for the court to make its voice heard. And that's why we need informed journalists to do a good job. I'm going to use the opportunity that we are, because this is the theme of this, uh, sub, of this uh, event is image and sound, right? Belt and geluid. So, um, because you're a journalist and also for the ICC, I think image says a lot. So, one picture says more than a thousand words, right? And then we have from the ICC publications those pictures of the prosecutor or or people from yeah personal from the persecutors that uh, show pictures with a regime or with uh, the yeah people that are of course you said a high level in the in the regime of these countries and um, how to contr how to go back how to take that low lower because people have the expectation like Carla said. Oh, look, look how they are shaking hands. That says so much for people who have very little access to media. Look how they shake hands. Look how they are uh, very friendly talking. And I understand that from the ICC, that's yeah, something that is diplomatic. But from the people who are there being the victims, that says so much and brings so much frustration. Because on the other side, you don't have the ICC shaking hands with the e NGOs or with the journalists because they say, well, that's not uh, good for the persecution. Of course, there's reasons. but there must be a way to be able to also send that signal that we are doing the right thing and that we are not being manipulated by the regimes. But maybe you can share thoughts on that? Because my second question was mainly to, um, to you, sorry, Ben from Uganda, because you have more experience. How do you, uh, with the time, how do you see uh, the expectations how dif different the expectations from the people with what can be achieved from the ICC and how, d how 
could you maybe give us tips on how to manage that enormous gap? Yeah, I hope I got your question right, but uh, let me start with the, the first question, because I think uh, we have been very critical of the ICC as well, uh, as my country, but also if you look at the war in northern Uganda, which took almost 23 years, and this is the thing that we've been having uh, debates about back home. You have Dominic Nguyen in the wanting list. He has been arrested. You have the LRA commander, Joseph Coyne. We had another commander, uh, T. Vincent, who is reportedly dead. But you don't have a single UPDF officer who is from the government side. To be honest with you, if you speak to very many of those people, and I was able to attend some of the sessions of Dominic Nguyen, Clearly, government had a role. And the question is, why is the ICC looking this way and doesn't also look that way? Mm. And it's, it's open, because I remember one of the UPF general in Uganda did speak about it very openly. And the ICC, I'm not saying they're being selective. Yes, they go to Dominic Gongwen, they may go to Joseph Coyne, but why can't they go for those people in the government forces and say, we're bringing you here? So we... I think the, the image of the ICC, which I think I need them to step a bit higher, is uh, sometimes we feel like, you know, they're over enjoying the handshake with the <laughs> perpetrator or uh, some of the people we believe back home there that they're perpetrators. Because why would um, uh, Bashi, for example, come to Uganda, which is a member state and uh, it doesn't get arrested? We had this conversation before and yet they're obligated to the sense of responsibility that uh, those member states should hold on the ICC, and the ICC should tighten the knot a bit, because I feel like they are also very uh, soft sometimes, in my opinion. The second question that you did ask, how do we, um, the gaps that we do have, I hope I got that question right. Um, I think the expectation, again, as I said earlier, is very huge uh, from the people. The expectation is me as a journalist is just to try to, when I travel to the Hague like this, I've had this discussion when they go back on the radio, I'll tell them what I've been able to have. When I come with the, during the trial when I was coming, I, I, I report what I've been able to see. But I think um, justice for a common man, for me that's been my thought, that very common person in the village that is hoping that something is gonna happen in the Hague is for me a bigger question and how Dominic Nguyen has been sentenced. Is it good enough? Is people going to feel all right with it? As I said earlier on, I think people will not get their lost one back. But there must be a lot of work to be done, especially to rehabilitate people uh, mentally. Um, in terms of infrastructure, there's a lot of things that we still desire, especially to bridge that gap, and people feel like uh, we have got a bit of some justice. Um, the handshake question that was mentioned also illustrates very well an inbuilt difficulty in the uh, ICC system. Ruiz Moreno Campo was the first chief prosecutor, was criticized because he gave a press conference together with President Museveni of Uganda in London. Uh, uh, and some people said he shouldn't have done that because President Museveni is also a potential suspect that he should investigate if uh, he finds credible evidence of, of war crimes. But the issue is um, the ICC is not only a court but also an international organization where you have now 123, if I'm not mistaken, states parties. So um, the chief prosecutor as a principal of that court, it's also a high official of that international organization that deals with states' parties. So if um, uh, um, a head of state of a state party uh, wants to talk to him or even give a press conference together, it's a bit difficult to refuse. Uh, but, uh, and he was criticized internally in his office um, for that. So it's, uh, the ICC is still a new court and it has to define its, to define its uh, role and to find the ways it works and um, even after um, 21 years one still uh, discovers new difficulties all the time. One second thing one might say about Uganda because it's also very illustrative of that dilemma I just tried to explain. Uh, Museveni tried to frame the referral as asking the OTP to investigate only, only the lost resistance army and, and uh, um, Moreno Campos said I understand the referral to be 
for the situation in northern Uganda, which means that I can also uh, uh, investigate um, government crimes if I find evidence. And as Benson said, uh, there have never ch been charges being brought. Uh, um, and when you ask the uh, ambassador of Uganda here, she says, well, we have investigated and prosecuted ourselves and reported about it uh, to the ICC under the principle of complementarity. And the ICC OTP says that the Ugandan judiciary, they are satisfied that the Ugandan judiciary does its work. Yeah, which is not enough answer to me. Uh, <laughs> Because I remember we did ask the prosecutor then, Ben Suda, and we asked her, what is going on? Where have you reached with the either investigation or start investigation into some of the faces we see in Uganda's government? And the answers they give us, we're still processing the file. I don't know how long they'll process it, but it's clearly that they know that some of the perpetrators of the crime are really from government side. And it's naive that you go for only the, the rebel side and clearly if you speak to victims of the war, you'll get that the government had a role. So it's very naive for me that the ICC really sticks its gun there, but looks a bit down on the other side. Uh, the president is a big catch, as you said, and um, there's so many things about him as well. So I think the ICC should, uh, that's why sometimes people think they're selective in nature, especially targeting African countries, da, 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 da. But for me, in my opinion, I think, uh, for the LRA war, it's a typical case. They have to go for government officials as well. It is indeed uh, critical and essential for the credibility of international courts that they are perceived to be interested in the crimes of all sides. If an international court sides with one party in the conflict or is perceived as doing so, it undermines its credibility. To the to the shaking hand and uh, the hope that the second man uh, said, uh, 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 the most important, important thing is that uh, the, the shaking hand, it, it is not uh, affecting the, uh, uh, the rule of law, the, the, the judge and the court and the ICC. Uh, we, 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 the hope uh, that we have is that uh, uh, the, judge, the, the, the ICC judges are uh, independent, uh, which, is, we, which is not uh, uh, the same with uh, other uh, other courts uh, like uh, uh, East African Court of Justice, like uh, uh, African Court of uh, Human Rights, uh, and, uh, and the purpose uh, the, the two established in, in, in Arusha in Tanzania. Uh, the, the, the second source for uh, our hope is that uh, uh, all the judgments uh, we, which are made by the ICC, uh, there is a follow up. But, uh, uh, the, the, the East African Court of Justice and the African uh, Court of Human Rights, 80% uh, of their uh, uh, judgments are not uh, uh, followed, they are not uh, executed. So uh, the judge of those uh, two courts that I mentioned, they are approved by the, the, the head of state, the, which means that they are not uh, uh, independent. So uh, our hope uh, is, uh, again, uh, our, uh, as a journalist, uh, uh, our commitment to, to be always the voice of voiceless people, uh, to, 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 to hold our pen, our mic, our camera, so that uh, those victims uh, can have uh, justice. Um, we were talking about the shaking hand. I have two things to say. First, Prosecutor Karinkam was in Venezuela shaking hands with Maduro and in his face announced that he will be initiating an investigation against his regime for crimes against humanity after shaking hands. And the second thing I have to say is yesterday we met a marvelous ambassador and he told us, I think because this was my question to him, and he responded that don't think that, uh, for example, Calix Ortega is being receiving in every space, in every office, as he's, is, as he's telling his own people. The doors are closed to them here in The Hague. He's like going around, but not necessarily everybody is, is wanting to talk with him. Thank you. I would like to Leanne and Carla if the fact of be women, uh, it's a challenge, an, another challenge. Uh, facing uh, in order to report in justice news? Um, 
Thank you for that, um, Cindy. I cover justice um, in my country, and I have had many passive-aggressive comments passed on me by all kinds of men. Um, and the, the, the challenges a woman reporter faces on the legal beat is we are always sexualized. Um, one time I was covering a hearing, and one of the lawyers told me, I was eating my lunch, and one lawyer told me, there's something about a woman who opens her mouth like that or something like that. I know like it was to intimidate me. Um, and looking back years from now, I should have said something more you know, assertive. But it is always the burden put on women to stand up for yourself. But in the moment, you can't really do anything. So as a woman, you're always sexualized. You either have to be aggressive. If you're not aggressive enough, then you're not a strong woman enough. Um, but if you are soft-spoken, then you're not strong woman for them. But if you're a strong woman, then you're too aggressive. So it, it's very hard uh, to find the balance. Thanks, Lean. There was a gentleman there who would have been lifting his hand for quite some time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for this wonderful conversation. I want to follow up a little bit on from um, the previous conversation about um, like how do you shape in the narratives in your respective country. I also come from a very um, different country in Asia and China um, with a civil society background. Um, when you work with authoritarian figures, um, they are very good at or they are very um, manipulating the, uh, the whole uh, machine to create their own narratives. So this part of my trouble, even though I'm not a journalist, is to how do you find the friends in your respective country, friends or allies or like-minded friends, whatever we phrase it, and then um, build the story from there uh, without all the resources that is available to you. I think I hear that um, from time to time in your speech and when you're answering questions. I just want to um, have a last chance to uh, gorge your thoughts on that. You know, as a journalist, one of the things that uh, we always have are sources. Uh, I can tell you I have people within government that I speak to. That one is for sure. I have also people within the opposition that I speak to. I have people within the judiciary that I speak to. There are some who give me information that really helps me. Um, but again, in my country, we have a colleague of mine called Solomon Serwanya. He's a BBC award winner. He formed an investigative institute for it's actually called African Investigative Institute. So it brings together different investigative journalists like mine so that we can be able to tackle the fears that you, you're saying, how do we come together and tackle some of these issues? And we've been uh, able to aggressively go on some of the cases, not only on justice, even on government, on corruption. And I think uh, when you come together, like we are in this panel and um, some of our colleagues, uh, we will be able to shape a lot of discussion going forward. But I think as a journalist, you always have uh, some sources, which of course you protect them. Uh, you don't uh, expose them. That will give information. Of course, we hear from the stories that you've been able to hear. We come from countries where sometimes the space for truth is very limited. So you really need to find a way of working around it uh, so that uh, you give people or you become more, of, uh, you do stories that are more uh, human interest that can help people. Yes, and uh, as we might add to uh, those in the public who are not journalists and don't know how uh, journalists work, firstly, uh, protection of sources is a holy principle. If a source does not want to be named or quoted, then you respect that. And you can try to write an article with the information, not naming the source or making it identifiable. Um, and when journalists work with sources, they must or they talk to people, they must agree on the status of that conversation. If it is an interview, or if it's background talk, or if it is uh, off the record, if it's Chatham House rules, where you can use the information uh, uh, um, without making the source identifiable. So journalism is um, uh, a complex world, and the way we deal with our sources, and what makes the context of the ICC even more interesting and even more difficult is that the way 
journalists deal with politicians, defense lawyers, or other sources, also is culturally different from country to country. So the fact that here in The Hague, a Bosnian journalist may talk to a French defense lawyer also creates the complication that they have different ideas about the rules, about the interaction between journalists and sources. Sources. I also um, make it a point that when, a, when I approach a source for their story and they ask me, what will happen if I tell you my story, that I don't promise anything. It's like my number one rule that I don't promise anything. And to be honest, um, when they ask me what will happen, sometimes I say, to be honest with you, maybe nothing. Maybe nothing will happen after you tell me your story. So that's entirely up to you. And I just try to appeal um, to their humanity that maybe their story can give themselves a sense of peace that they were able to tell their story. And, and if I may, to answer the gentleman's question about how, what is my mission to make a positive change in my country, I would say that journalists are not in the business of making an intentional positive change or making your stories intentionally optimistic. Our only duty is to um, say the truth um, and report uh, the truth. But this is what I'll say. Filipinos, they're very, very positive. But I write my stories in a way that tries to remove the burden on Filipinos to be resilient and try to put accountability on the government to do their jobs well. Thanks, Lee. Yes, there is a hand there. Unfortunately, I can't see the people well because the lights are shining in my face, but um, Janet is going to you. Thank you. My name is Joel. We all know that there is an upcoming uh, election in Venezuela in 2024. Uh, my question is, how, what, what are some of the challenges uh, you preempt as a journalist uh, in the upcoming election, and how well uh, are the journalists in Venezuela prepared uh, for the election in regards to amplifying the voices of the people or the voices of the marginalized during the election? Yeah. The first challenge is to have a free and fair election. And that's pretty, that looks like pretty difficult because first of all, we have one of the candidates in exile recently. That there could be, <laughs> there couldn't be an, an free and fair election since now. But the second challenge will be that every politician right now in Venezuela is uh, working to change the head of the system the head of the regime, right? They think that changing the president will, will change the system. And the thing that has to be changed is the system in, in, in itself. Because we have this death system machine uh, based on these abominable principles of disappearing people, of disappearing dissent, uh, with no opposition. And they think that looking forward to the 2024, it will be, they will find a solution. And the solution has to, to start right now. We have to stop this death machine. For example, uh, four years ago, we had like 3,000 uh, extrajudicial executioner uh, killings, extrajudicial killings. And now we have 800. Some said the death system is in a pause. But this is not the, the main goal. We have to stop the machine. It's not like putting in a less velocity the system. It's to defeat the, 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 the velocity. It's to stop the death machine. It's to have no, zero killings. Not to change 3,000 uh, for 800. It's to not have any kill, any torture in Venezuela. And there is a system that is functioning that way. Changing the head will not change anything. Does it mean for your work that um, you are a Venezuelan journalist based in the US? I know. And we have to deal with two narratives. Because when people inside Venezuela think that because we are in the exile, and, and they, are, they are right, we are protect, we are safe. But inside Venezuela, it's more difficult um, to find someone to call Maduro a dictator. They are changing the way to, to speak about him 
because there are risks, and, and we know. But if you don't have a defined narrative of what the, the nature of this system is, how you will defeat it? <laughs> it it's, it's different to fight against a traditional politician, traditional democracy, uh, than to fight against a criminal organization um, inside the government, inside the regime. The strategies will be, it has to be, so different. And we have to, to um, have an encounter of those narratives in, in the exile and in, in between, between Venezuela. We have to, at some point, to be, agree <laughs> about how we will be fight against him, be, uh, against them, because if not, we are not be able to, to win or to regain democracy and freedom. The Burundian press is in a similar situation. All journalists, many good journalists in exile in Rwanda, in Uganda, in Kenya, in Belgium. Uh, yes, now we are uh, more than 100 uh, journalists from Burundi in exile. More than 100, it's a, it's a, big, uh, it's a big number. But uh, from exile, we continue to, to do our investigative uh, uh, work, uh, which is uh, very important for us because uh, we, we, we get to connect uh, um, uh, victims of those uh, crimes against uh, humanity to the, to the royals, to the uh, human rights activists, to the uh, ICC. For now, I say that uh, we have uh, uh, more than two. Uh, thousand cases or communications uh, brought to the, to, the, to the ICC. So even if we, uh, we do not have uh, 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 access to the, to the main sources in Burundi, we, we, we manage to, to do our work uh, in, the, in the refugee camps and in in around the, 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 the other countries so that we can uh, get uh, the voice of, uh, voice of uh, voiceless people. And there is an example here in the Netherlands of uh, Radio da Banga, Sudanese journalists working here in the Netherlands and trying to make sure that people in Darfur, where the crimes the ICC deals with were committed, have access to good professional and objective information work they have been doing on shortwave and internet, I think, have been doing for, for many years. Um, thank you all for your questions and thank you for the panelists, unfortunately, Time is running out because this room will be needed um, for another purpose later. Um, as Rosemary already pointed out with her first question, you have been thinking so much of the victims and telling so much about uh, the horrible things that happen in your countries. You have been thinking less about yourselves and your difficulties and uh, your merits and the prizes uh, you win, but we heard Still, we heard quite a lot about uh, your work, and uh, I think we have also learned um, a bit more uh, about the ICC system during this hour and a half. So thanks ag again to everybody who was here and who was on the panel and who maybe have been following us uh, online. Uh, this ev event has also been recorded, and it will be available uh, uh, on the Internet uh, very soon for those who want to watch it again. Thank you very much. <laughs>